All right. Hello, everyone out there in uh, YouTube land or wherever it is you're joining us from. Uh, you are back at our, um, our symposium today. And today we have a great opportunity for the next uh, almost an hour to talk about women in water science. And we have three fantastic panelists who I'm going to introduce you to in just a moment. Um, but first, a quick kind of uh, preview. Um, according to the most recent data released by uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, over 90% of the American West is in some state of drought, with most of, most of Utah being classified as an either extreme or exceptional drought. We know that water shortages stress human and non-human populations. They exacerbate the impacts of pollution and create social and, social and political tensions. Today, we are fortunate to have three outstanding women with us who are working on identifying environmental harms, developing solutions, lobbying for change, and working on projects to make a tangible difference. So today we'll hear from Wei Hong Wang, Sarah Porterfield, and Melissa Stamp. They'll share a bit about their work um, and you'll have a chance, they'll have a chance to ask each other some questions and then you'll have a chance to ask them some questions as well. I'll introduce them each individually, and uh, after they're done, just kind of give it, give you a quick intro on the next panelist, and uh, and we're off to the races. Wei Hong Wang is an associate professor in the Department of Earth Science at Utah Valley University. She graduated with a PhD in marine science science from the University of South Carolina in 2008, and her research interests include anthropogenic impact on wetland ecosystems. GIS and remote sensing applications, and energy use and sustainability. Her current research focuses on nutrient loading in Utah Lake and land use and land use land cover classification within the Utah Lake watershed. She uses GIS remote sensing techniques. Thank you for being here, Weehan. It's all yours. Thank you, Mike, for um, the introduction. Um, it's nice to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to share my screen since I have a short presentation to share with you. OK, great. So today I'm going to talk a little about you know human impact on Utah Lake and share uh, with you my one of my current projects on Utah Lake. Um, so before we talk about Utah Lake, I always want to do a um, simple introduction about the lake. So as you can see, there there was a large um, you know freshwater lake in Utah, Idaho, and also um, you know uh, Nevada. Then it was uh, called Lake Bonneville. So Utah Lake is one of the remnant lakes uh, of Lake Bonneville. So the other two are Great Salt Lake and Lake Sevier. Uh, Utah Lake is about 24 miles long and 12 miles uh, across. And you know, this is a, such an amazing feature in Utah. It's one of the largest freshwater west of uh, Mississippi River, but it's very shallow, surprisingly. I'm going to explain to you why in a second. And the water in some part of the lake, the water a little bit saline just because of the high rate of evaporation. Since I'm from Earth Science, I'm going to show you this short video. It's just a one minute uh, video clip. It's going to help us to understand, you know, the formation of valleys here and the mountain range, which is the Wasatch mountain range, right? It, uh, it is going to also um, give us some hints why it's really challenging if we want to build something ever on the lake.
So the reason I want to show this video, um, first of all, we want to know, you know, why we have the Wasatch Mountain Range here. And also we know there the Wasatch Fault, right? Then a normal fault is the east, the eastern edge of the uh, uh, basin range extension, actually, which is around here. And as you can see, people think, oh, why Utah Lake cannot be a deep blue lake? Probably it's not going to be in a narrow it never was right. So there, are, there was a, there is a very deep sediment, sediment deposit from the Lake Bonneville, and uh, you can see this lake is always this depth, not that deep, not shallow. It's not changing much. Then it's because, um, you know, the lake is experiencing subduction and same time there's a sedimentation process that's going on. So the lake is going to be like this shallow, likely into the future. The same time, you know, we don't really see a clear lake is because, you know, the input of calcite in the water column, and also we have the carp um, in the water as well. Uh, those are the factors contributing to the cloudiness of the lake. But the Utah Lake by all means is a very unique lake. So I cannot uh, imagine if we lose this feature one day. So this image shows you how significant Utah Lake is to us. So the, uh, the grayish color refers to Utah County, the county we live in. And then the purplish outline is the Utah Lake watershed. Utah Lake is somewhere you know, in the middle of Utah, Utah County. So this one is even more, this figure is even more significant because we can see Utah Valley, the dark part. So Utah Lake is almost like one third of the, occupying one third of the valley. So then it is very significant. Um, so if we have everything from human activities, we will for sure know it's going to end up in Utah Lake, right? So here, um, this map shows us some human activities around the lake within the watershed. So we have the orange dots here. They are referring to the waste, the water treatment, and the plants around the Utah Lake. There are seven of them. And then we have agri agricultural lands. We have mining sites. So I want to, I want to point out, you know, uh, after the human settlement here, we didn't have the um, we saw treatment plants until early 1950s. Before before 1950s, all the raw sewage went into the lake. So later on, you know, we had the first we saw treatment plant in 1950s with only primary uh, treatment uh, capability, and then later on we add the secondary treatment. But still, we have a concern over the phosphorus input to the lake from the wastewater treatment plants. And also farming and the agricultural activities also introduce a lot of nutrients to the lake. On top of that, we have a lot of invasive species. So for example, we have uh, introduced common carp, catfish, bass, and also uh, Northern pike, those species were introduced intentionally or accidentally, but it doesn't matter, you know, in which manner we are having a hard time to get rid of them. And also they are causing native fish species to extinct or near extinction. So then it is a really concern to us. So as I mentioned, we have a lot of problems, um, you know, due to human activities. One of them is the excessive nutrient input to the lake. So I collaborate with BYU, UVU, and USU faculty uh, in involving a lot of students uh, from UVU to work on this big project. So it's a two-year project. We have um, finished the first year. So we started taking samples um, a year ago, pretty much, just a year ago, it's October, 2020. So you may ask why it's important to study nutrient loading to the lake. So first of all, if you have been to the lake in the summer, sometimes part of the lake is closed or there's a warning saying it's not safe to swim or get into the water. Then it's because of the harmful algal blooms. So um, one main reasons, likely the nutrient is one of the main reasons for the uh, harmful algal blooms. And also our research will help 
uh, division of water quality to establish a in lake nutrient standard. So hopefully we can contribute to, um, you know, to this uh, management practice. Hopefully we can improve the lake water quality. Um, another reason is important to conduct this um, project is I want to involve UVU students because this is something really personal since a lot of students are from Utah, from Utah County, they need to know what Utah is and the science, um, scientific facts behind it and support the right practice and the management practices. And also against the not sound um, proposals, right? And also a lot of people who live in Utah County, they have not never been to the lake. So there are a lot of wrong or inaccurate perceptions on Utah Lake. So this project hopefully can bring uh, more awareness to the general public to, to help people to understand Utah Lake, how important Utah Lake is. So just briefly, I'm gonna show you, you know, my sampling size. We take samples from the rivers upstream and downstream. So then that can give us an uh, indication, you know, how human activities might affect nutrient um, concentrations. And also we sample uh, with the water treatment plants. We also set do seasonal sampling uh, in the lake. At the same time, we try to uh, sample a test groundwater input and also capture um, you know, storm water runoff as well. So hopefully um, our um, effort will help us to build a more uh, accurate nutrient uh, loading model for Utah Lake and the help of the state for the management. One thing I'm very proud of um, all my projects, all my projects on Utah Lake uh, always involve UVU students. You know, they, they are really inspired by um, the, the things they were doing just because they get to know the lake, they get to know the importance of the lake, they take it um, as a pride that they feel like, you know, we are connected to the lake, we need to do more to protect the lake. So they have a lot of fun, at the same time they present um, uh, in, in different scientific conferences to share the knowledge, uh, you know, the findings with a broader uh, community. Yeah, so that is my introduction on Utah Lake. Thank you. Thank you, Weehan. That was great. Uh, Melissa and Sarah, do you mind how I flip the order? Because after Weehan's presentation, Melissa, yours seems to now present to me the logical order. Do you mind? Okay, great. Uh, so I want to introduce you all to Melissa Stamp, and I need to tell you a very, very brief story to help you understand how I know her and why she's such a great uh, addition to this panel. Uh, several months ago, um, I, I recognized something. I lived near the Provo River, and I recognized that the river was being constricted for a bridge project. And I was worried about uh, the, the primary native fish to, to Utah Lake, which migrates right next to, right, migrates up that river, and how they would make it up the river past this little impediment that existed. And well, through a long uh, series of conversations, I was directed to Melissa Stamp, who uh, reminded me and connected with some other people and said, no, that little impediment shouldn't be there, that those fish need to get upstream. Well, Melissa has been uh, the director or the uh, coordinator supervisor of a project to um, restore the, uh, the delta in, that once existed where Provo, the Provo River goes into Utah Lake. And so I am excited to hear what she has to about, say about that and some other things. So Melissa, it's all yours. Great, can you guys hear me okay? I'm gonna share the screen. Hopefully you guys are seeing my slide okay. Yeah, so I um, wanted to just share a little bit about um, who I am and where I've been and what I've done in my career. And I will touch a little bit more in detail on, on the, the Provo River Delta Restoration Project, which as Dr. Weeks mentioned, is how we connected. Um, but my undergraduate degree is in, in geography from Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. So I thought I'd share a map because I like maps. I'm um, showing you a little bit about uh, how I landed in Utah. I've lived in Utah for about 25 years. 
so a long time. But prior to that, um, I had the opportunity to do some work in um, various parts of the country uh, prior to going to grad school. So some shorter term positions in various places and then wound up in Utah where I got a master's degree in watershed science from Utah State University uh, back in 2000. And I had a career for about 12 years working for an environmental consulting company called BioWest. And uh, during my work as a watershed scientist for that firm, I worked on water-related projects um, all throughout the Western states from Montana all the way to Texas. Um, and then for the last six years working for the Mitigation Commission, that work's been exclusively in Utah, but uh, been able to travel around, work on a lot of different river systems, and I included this slide to kind of highlight the fact that work in the water science field is definitely not boring. Um, I think the topic of water was also attractive to me because I'm not always very good at making up my mind. Um, I'm kind of the person that maybe at age 50 is still like, what am I going to be when I grow up? So if you're working in water, there's all kinds of different aspects. You can work in the water science, the management, policy, uh, regulations. It's a, it's a complex field where coming up with some solutions really re require considering a lot of different moving parts. Um, you know, so I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but in my career, I've kind of gotten to play a lot of different roles. I've gotten to put on hard hats and inspect stormwater at uh, protections at construction sites or um, monitor construction of a restoration project. I've spent quite a bit of time wearing waders and getting into rivers to measure stream flow, counting pebbles and measuring pebbles to figure out what's going on with gravel bars and sediment transport. Um, in my current position as a project coordinator with the Mitigation Commission, it's definitely more administrative. So put on the office clothes and do a lot of virtual meetings uh, lately, but, you know, helping to make decisions. So definitely a diverse field and um, included this slide. Uh, it's a little random, but just kind of wanted to share maybe a personal note, given that the symposium is about environmental ethics. And I think thinking about that topic got me thinking about what my personal environmental ethics are, how those evolved. Um, and so this is an image uh, that my mother painted. She's an artist. And this is the Pemigewasset River in New Hampshire on the property where uh, my parents now live. And this is the place where our family spent summer vacations growing up. And so this is a special place to me. Um, and I think the time I spent there as a child, swimming, canoeing, or just sitting on the dock, watching the water go by, really uh, helped me sort of learn to value how important river systems are, how important ecologically healthy rivers are to human beings. It's kind of a even a mental health thing for me. Um, and there's a lot of kind of cool neurological science coming out now that demonstrates how biologically connected human beings are to nature and specifically to trees and water. So anyway, that's just a little bit of maybe how I wound up where I am personally and why I have a passion for environmental work. Um, this slide is kind of hitting on, as I've thought about what I've worked on over the years, um, these are some themes that I feel like inspire my work. The idea of giving rivers space, keeping rivers wet, and connecting rivers and people. And Dr. Wang kind of touched on some of the similar themes um, in her presentation. And I'm going to kind of just jump through these next examples for the sake of time and spend a few moments sharing uh, some details about this Provo River Delta Restoration Project. And I um, need to give a big shout out to Dr. Weeks for bringing to our attention that issue with uh, a bridge construction project that had copper dammed off the lower Provo River. And uh, some of the people that needed to be aware of that were not aware of it at the time. And um, some actions were taken to resolve that concern. Um, and that's something that I'm still going to keep pushing on making sure it continues to happen. Um, the agency I work for is a participating agency in the June Sucker Recovery in Implementation Program. And the June Sucker is now listed as threatened, a threatened uh, fish species 
up until last February, it was listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. But because of this project and many other efforts uh, implemented by the recovery program, it's on its way towards recovery. And that's a big milestone to have it downlisted to threatened. Um, and it's one of only two native fish left in Utah Lake. The, the lake is now mostly occupied by in, invasive fish species as and, and non-native fish species. So this Provo River Delta Restoration Project, um, I am the lead project coordinator for this project. Um, and it's been the focus of most of my work effort really <laughs> over the last six years. And, and it's, exciting, it's an exciting and ambitious $50 million project that is tied again to this need to recover the threatened June sucker, um, reconnecting it to the nursery habitat that the young fish need to survive. The fish are able to spawn, but the, the eggs that they lay that hatch into larvae tend to uh, die out in the channelized existing river channel. Um, so again, this is very much a multi-agency effort, and it's being done under that nine-agency strong June sucker recovery program with additional partners beyond that. And, and so this project, I think many of the audience are, are students at Utah Valley University. So this is close by. This is down at the mouth of the Provo River, this Utah Lake State Park, um, down at the uh, bottom left of your slide. And the project involves acquiring about 260 acres of agricultural land and diverting the majority of the Provo River's flow north into this constructed um, restored delta habitat area. We're also lowering part of a dike that currently blocks Utah Lake from this land. This whole area um, was historically a bay of Utah Lake and I really appreciated uh, sort of the geologic history that was shared um, by Dr. Wong um, also. And so, yeah, the project will allow part of this bay to be restored and really allow those riverine habitats to mix with the lake habitat and provide that nursery um, habitat that the June sucker needs to survive. And other cool parts of the project, so this is giving river space, right? Right now, the lower river, um, this all is part of what was historically the lake bed of Utah Lake. And there are levees on both sides of the river down through here, and it's not connected to a wide floodplain. And so with this project, I'm always a fan of any project that gives rivers some more space. Um, keeping rivers wet, that's another aspect of this project and of the June Sucker Program effort um, as a whole. There has been an enormous investment, literally of tens of millions of dollars, in acquiring water supplies dedicated to the June Sucker. And you know, even in a year like this year, which was super dry, um, exceptional drought, as Dr. Weeks mentioned, um, because of the emphasis on wanting to make sure once the delta is connected, um, which will happen about a year from now, we plan to divert the, the river into this new uh, habitat. And um, there's been a lot of effort to make sure that the river doesn't dry up. And Provo, used, Provo River used to dry up in the summer. It's perfectly legal in the state to divert the entire river's flow if people have water rights to do that. And so it's mostly been through cooperative agreements with uh, the water district and so forth and purchases of water for this purpose that have been able to keep the Provo River wet even in a year like this. Um, and the last element I'll mention about the project is this idea of connecting rivers and people. Um, and I think that's so important because a lot of people don't go to Utah Lake. They don't know that there's a river several blocks down the road. Um, in Salt Lake City, where I live and work, where our office is based, um, they've buried the bottom third of all the creeks that flow through Salt Lake City in underground culverts. And so they're like literally gone. That's as disconnected as you can get. Um, and I've done some work. I did a riparian corridor study, and there's a really cool new nonprofit that's uh, working on and just finished an awesome project to daylight um, some of those creeks, bring them back to the surface and let people connect with those rivers, those streams again here in Salt Lake City. And that all started with a student at uh, University of Utah. So um, it can happen and it's pretty exciting when it does. But for this project, 
you know, one of the other times that I uh, met Dr. Weeks is on a site tour. So we've been doing a lot of site tours. Our outreach and engagement has suffered a little bit with COVID and we've had to shift gears, but kind of being outside and being able to uh, show people this active construction project while it's in the works has been a great outreach tool. And I think it's really valuable to make sure the community knows about the project. There's gonna be all kinds of recreation features and interpretive exhibits um, associated with it. We're also, this existing channel will remain in place. It will continue to be a community amenity and receive a small amount of flow. Um, and so it's just a pretty exciting project to be part of. And, and I will share one more, if I can get my mouse to work, maybe not. Um, yeah, this is just a website where you guys can go to learn more about the project if you're interested. That's what I had. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, I, I, I'm gonna give um, a shout out to the tour. I did take it and it was wonderful and informative. Um, and I love how we hung and Melissa, your presentation so nicely connect. And I hope we can put you in conversation about the, the, the interrelationships there. But I wanna extend uh, the Sarah Porterfield, I wanna expand your scope a little bit uh, from um, the Great Basin where waters go to die, not really, but waters uh, don't lead to the ocean to uh, the Colorado River where Sarah Porterfield, who was in my cohort of the PhD program at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, we, I don't know how many conversations I got into with her about the Colorado River. You could not stop, you could not get her to stop talking about this place. And now she gets to uh, spend, um, this portion of her career any, any way advocating for it through Trout Unlimited. And I have to say, I'm thrilled that you're doing what you're doing, um, that you love it, and that we get a chance to hear a little bit about it. But a little tidbit, most of you probably don't know that uh, at least 20% of the water that enters into Utah County does not come from the Great Basin. It comes instead from the Colorado River watershed. Uh, with that, Sarah, it's all yours. Hey, thank you, Michael. Um, and thank you both uh, Dr. Wing and Ms. Stamp. This has been really educational for me. Um, I am not a scientist. I'll get into my background here in a minute, but I would not be able to do the work that I do without our team of scientists that we have at Trout Unlimited or TU um, who really inform the work that we do. Um, so I, I'll, I'll start with a little bit of background. I don't have a slideshow because my work is a little all over the place, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, but I'll start with my background and talk about the kind of work that I do. Um, and I can focus a little bit on the Colorado River as well. Uh, so I grew up in Southern California where um, we also, I grew up just north of LA, received, I think it's about 20% of our water there from the Colorado River. And now I live in Boulder, Colorado, where we also receive about 20% of our Colorado, our water from the Colorado River. None of these places are in the natural, you know, physically defined watershed of the Colorado. Um, but just to illustrate, you know, I've lived all over the West and in most places that I've lived, um, I have been using Colorado River water, even without living within the watershed. Um, so growing up in Southern California, my family and I would take road trips throughout the West and often ended up in Utah and Colorado and Wyoming um, within the Colorado River Basin. And of course, I read um, Edward Abbey, problematic as he is, um, but it, that got me into the water issues through the Monkey Wrench Gang and some of his other novels and, and works of nonfiction or relatively nonfiction. Um, and thinking about the river systems that we use and how we relate to them. Um, I went to school in the Pacific Northwest for undergrad and did my undergraduate degree in history there. Um, and then started working for the Colorado Outward Bound School based in Jensen and Moab, Utah, um, and worked as a raft guide for that raft and backpacking and technical canyoneering uh, instructor for them for probably far too long. Um, but that just deepened my relationship with the Colorado River and with Western water. Uh, and so I decided to go back to grad school. Um, this would have been 11 years ago now. I think we started the same year, Michael. Um, and so it's been a while now. Uh, and came to Boulder, where I still live, um, and decided to focus my graduate studies in the history department on the Colorado River. And my dissertation was on the transnational history of the Colorado River Basin. So we think about the Colorado River, we think about Western water, we think about the West as this uniquely dry, arid region in an otherwise well-watered nation, right? But if we think about white settlement, um, white 
colonists, settler colonialism moving west from generally from the East Coast, right, they encountered um, this dry region that seemed to be a problem to solve, right? Um, and so we have, at least mainstream culture has traditionally seen the history of the Colorado River and of, of Western water as one of American exceptionalism, one of American triumph over natural resources, right? Providing water where there was, where there was perceived to not be water. Um, so I took that sub, that narrative and decided to look at, well, okay, how has the Colorado River not been just a national river, but an international river? How has it been connected to rivers around the world? And I looked at that through legislation, the creation of the um, National Reclamation Act, which um, created what is today the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, then when it was created in 1902 was the Reclamation Service, but how that, that um, government agency to manage water, to develop water projects, grew out of an international transnational conversation at the end of the 19th century about how to manage and use water resources that is largely rooted or is rooted in colonialism. Um, I also looked at it through infrastructure. So thinking about, and then this I focused on uh, Hoover Dam, which is generally in kind of popular culture seen as, you know, an American triumph in the, the midst of the Great Depression, um, an engineering marvel, right? And I'm not saying it wasn't those things, but if we look at the history of it um, through the sort of father of Hoover Dam, as he's known, Arthur Powell Davis, his idea for a dam that big that could do things like flood control, irrigation, uh, et cetera, grew out of his travels around the world, right? He worked on the Panama Canal, then the largest dam in the world with the Gatun Dam. Uh, he worked on a large scale irrigation scheme in Central Asia, and he worked on a large scale flood project in China. Uh, and all of that combined to, to for him to come home to the US and um, come up with this idea for a large scale Hoover Dam. Um, and then third, I looked at recreation and how whitewater rafting, how recreation has played a role in environmentalism in the United States uh, through the Colorado, in the Colorado River Basin, and then how that environmentalism has been exported through outdoor recreation, through whitewater rafting around the world, uh, not always to um, maybe ideal ends uh, in other places. Um, so I finished my my graduate degree and worked working on that dissertation. Maybe it'll be a book at some point. We'll see what happens. Um, and I did not want to be in academia anymore. Um, I uh, wanted to, for a lot of reasons, which I'm more than happy to talk about in the Q and A. If folks are interested. Um, but I wanted to do something that felt more tangible to me and to work in the policy world. Uh, so almost exactly two, just over two years ago, I started working for Trout Unlimited and we're a conservation NGO. Um, we focus on cold water uh, resources for and habitat for trout and salmon. I don't know anything about fish or fishing, um, but I do know about water and I do know that fish need water. Um, so that's where my uh, my work lies. And what I do um, in my job, my title is Water Policy Associate for our Western Water and Habitat Program. So I work throughout the West, um, but with a focus on the Colorado River Basin. And um, to simply describe my job, it's to connect our on the ground projects and programs. We do a lot of um, restoration work. We do a lot of um, agricultural uh, infrastructure work. Um, we work on projects like, like the Pro Provo River Delta, right? Floodplain reconnection, allowing rivers to, to move, right? Giving them that room and also connecting people to rivers. Um, it's connecting those on the ground projects with federal programs uh, and federal funding and making that work better in both directions. Um, so I kind of, as my boss describes it, um, she and I and our, our small policy team, we're the white part of the Oreo cookie. So we're connecting you know, the, the chocolate part of the projects to the chocolate part of the federal programs and funding. Um, and what that looks like is I actually think to my day today is a pretty good illustration of how varied my job can be. You know, I started the day with um, listening in on a House Natural Resources Committee hearing on the Colorado River drought um, that um, many of the folks here have touched on uh, it, throughout the West. It's particularly bad in the Colorado River Basin. Um, I've then been participating in a two day training on being an ally in Indian country in order to expand our tribal partnerships and our work with tribes in the Colorado River Basin. Um, I get to hang out with you all and do some of this outreach and engagement um, and that's not, you know, part of TU. Um, Later today, I'll be in a working group on interim guidelines in the Colorado River Basin because we're coming up on uh, the point at which we'll have to renegotiate the operating operational guidelines and oper reservoir operations and, and decision making framework for the basin that will start soon and has to be finished by 2026. 
um, and also spend some time with the Department of the Interior's Climate Action Plan today. So it's a whole lot of different things, um, which is a pretty cool place to be for me. I like being able to see a river basin, to see a region from a number of different entry points. Um, and I think, you know, it can be, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if frustrating is the right, maybe frustrating is the right word, but I do a lot of work with federal agencies that are large and um, have a lot of inertia in the way that they have always done things. Uh, and so a lot of my work is kind of pushing at those agencies like Bureau of Reclamation to say, okay, can we, can we improve this program? Can we make it work better for the environment and fish and habitat? And then also working with our field field staff who are amazing and work across the basin and across the west really across the country um, to you know how do we create projects that that reach the aims that we want to see and get those funded by these federal programs um, so there's never a dull moment um, i guess there's a lot of uh, uh, job security in that there is uh, never a dull moment um, there are lots of thorny problems to try and untangle uh, and even though it feels like some days you're not making any progress, I think that um, it's a really fascinating field to be a part of because you can see change happen, even if, you know, maybe in the day to day, it doesn't feel like it. You look back over a year or two or five or 10 or 20 um, and you do see projects, you know, flourish and become what you always wanted them to be. You do see policies change. Um, you do see, you know, mindsets and motivations change and move towards a more collaborative and holistic view of the river and river systems. So, all in there. Thanks so much, Sarah. You know what I what I love in in hearing the three of you all together is um, just how clearly that or how much the ethics of how we address water and the environment is so deeply entangled in the politics um, in the science and the advocacy. And I think your presentations really helped us to see the interconnectedness or to use a very more, more recent word, the intersectionality in the science, the policy um, and the ethics of it all. Well, um, I have wanted to spend a little bit of time getting the, getting the three of you in conversation. And even though that's gonna be very truncated, I do wanna devote at least a few minutes to that. So. Um, if you wouldn't mind just either sharing your thoughts, um, comments on each other's presentations or asking a question. And I promise we will devote, uh, we will get to a few student questions and a few. So I'm just gonna open the mic up to the three of you. I'd love to hear you all talk. I can go on. I just maybe wanted to uh, say to Sarah that I hope you write your book because I would like to read it. <laughs> um, and I think it's pretty interesting, this sort of Colorado River nexus. Um, and I'll just maybe share with you guys that the Utah Reclamation Mitigation and Conservation Commission, it's a mouthful of an agency, but that's technically who I work for. And we are not technically part of Bureau of Reclamation. Um, the work we do is uh, kind of what reclamation staff do in all the other parts of the Colorado River Basin. And so it's it's interesting because some of what you're describing with the industrial sized uh, engineered features that allow water to be showing up from Colorado River in places like Utah Valley, Boulder, Colorado, and LA <laughs> all at the same time. Um, the impact of that infrastructure is essentially tied to why it actually has led in a weird way to some of the, the, the monies that are going towards this Delta restoration and the June sucker recovery because of all those impacts. And it goes back to um, impacts that predate my agency's existence. We came, we were uh, created in 1992 with the second round of funding for all that infrastructure um, but reclamation projects have been monkeying around with watersheds in Utah for a really long time since the early 19, like 1902 era. Um, so anyway, I just thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, I just have a comment, quick comment after hearing um, everyone's presentation. I think we, we, we work in different areas, you know, but uh, we are connected so closely. 
I do signs. I try to help the management and the inform policy as well. So I'm so proud of what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, and I, I hope I hope uh, you continue your research. And I'm curious to see what our project does in terms of nutrient loadings and and sort of the distribution of some of that. And I'm hoping that that connection to the floodplain can be a, a beneficial aspect of uh, the project related to water quality long-term on the lake as, as well. It needs all the help it can get. That's not like the primary focus of the project, but I think it makes a big difference um, to have kind of that cushion and that sponge of that large wetland uh, ecosystem before it enters the lake. Um, yeah, and it is really nice to, to uh, share with a couple other women, um, kind of the realm I work in, I'm typically outnumbered at least five to one, if not 10 to one, and at times 20 to one in most of the meetings that I participate in. You guys are nodding your heads, so you might know what I mean. Um, but I think, yeah, to the students out there, I, I hope, uh, I'd like some of you to start showing up in some of my meetings. So I hope you consider some environmental careers um, and, uh, yeah, it's a different perspective I think we can bring because we are often a minority <laughs> in the room. Yeah, I found both the um this follows well on your 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 comment here that um working with students or working with the public, you know, that connecting, as you said, uh, Melissa, collect, connecting people mm -hmm. to rivers. I think that's um and you we hung as well with students, you know, how how people experience the place in which they live and how that sense of place can be informed by and um and can build on scientific information because that gives a part of the story of a place um and how that leads people to become better advocates for the place in which they will live whether it's you know being a citizen scientist and coming out and you know, helping you all or, or to you build a like we do a lot of um, beaver dam analog work and floodplain reconnection and restoration, you know, if someone comes out and like weaves willow branches between a couple of uh, log posts for, you know, a day or or two, um, or writes a letter or signs a petition, you know, I think that that knowledge of place that comes in large part from scientific data and exploration is really important for how people advocate for the places where they live. Yeah, there we go. All right. So we're going to have a couple of questions right now. Uh, first of all, Alyssa, I'm glad to say that in this conversation, I'm pleasantly outnumbered. So here's a here's our question. Uh, and this is to everyone. What are the strengths in terms of accomplishing environmental goals? What are the strengths in terms of accomplishing environmental goals of policy work versus academic work? Uh, and I think all three of you have some experience in po both policy and academic work. Um, yeah, I can, I can start on that. I think that I can speak to this in a couple different ways. Um, one is from my own experience of being in academia and uh, leaving that, that world and moving into the policy world. I think what you learn in academia, whether it's undergraduate or graduate work, is um, how to think critically and creatively about problems, how to do good research, how to write, right? These are skills that I use every day in my work. So there's that side of, you know, how does academic work inform policy work? Um, and then it could also be, you know, in my case, it was that my um, research sub subject in graduate school turned into what I do on a daily basis now. Not always the case, so there's like skills and content, but I think that both of those can inform policy work. Um, and then academic work, we have a number of science, master's and PhD scientists on our staff um, at Trout Unlimited. Uh, and I, as I said, you know, I wouldn't be able to do what I do without their ability to, you know, provide data to quantify the kinds of um, outcomes and goals that we want to see in a project um, to be able to, you know, do the research that backs up the policy goals that we have. Melissa, do you want to go ahead? You go ahead first. Yeah, I just want to, yeah, I just want to point out, um, 
if you ask me to do science only, I don't think I, I will enjoy it that much because I want to use science as a tool to communicate what I do to the general public, to policymakers, to make a change in the world. If I only do science, I don't know, it's not something, um, I, I want to do applied science. That is what, what I want to say. We want to apply what we do, make it useful and to make something better in the world. Yeah, I'm not sure I have a lot to add, but I think um, what you guys were saying kind of about how the, the academic work I think is uh, kind of a key support system to making sure the science is there to lead and support the policy. And I think it all just works together. And um, I'm not sure in terms of the strengths, like which one maybe it would be more impactful. I, I think they both can be very impactful. And um, I think the policy is certainly key. Um, you know, and the, the work I do, we're able to do a project, but the long-term uh, kind of impact of that relies on a lot of policies, making sure that we don't have huge, you know, oil spills that go unchecked that take out the, you know, all the fish that we <laughs> managed to recover in this in this habitat. Um, it makes sure that there's policies. We have so much work to do in Utah and in the West in general to make sure that um, policies change, frankly, so that we can keep rivers wet. Um, there's no connection right now. We talk a lot about water conservation, but in Utah, there's no mechanism in the policies to tie water that, you know, if I take that shorter shower and I derescape my yard, the water that I've saved doesn't stay in Provo River. There's not a mechanism, there's not a connection, and that's a huge, I think, black hole in, in our uh, environmental protection policies right now. We also don't have all the many, so the Mitigation Commission has conserved, I think, about 26,000 acres of properties that we've purchased and we hand them over for long-term management typically. Uh, but almost all of those projects, because of the huge growth in, in our region, you know, are now, there's apartment complexes right up to the boundary. There's new homes going in every day. You have all those kind of uh, land management issues, and there's also no protections in Utah law or region, anything regionally or statewide. Other states do this, but Utah doesn't have anything that says you can't build right up to the edge of a stream. You can pave, pave right up to the edge. You can build right up to the edge of Utah Lake shoreline. There are no land use protections in our policies right now. So um, I don't work in policy. I'm more management, frankly, because it's the land that we own and, and we're able to kind of uh, sometimes have a voice in some of the policies. Um, but those are some things where that is a need I see in the policy arena that really complements this other work that's underlain by the science of the academic research. Mm -hmm. I just wanna share one point after Melissa's um, thoughts. I think they're the one frustration I want to share as a scientist. Um, sometimes I feel like it might be hard to convince some policymakers to follow the right path, even though, you know, um, the suggestions or recommendations are based on solid science. So then it can, could it be very frustrating. What I think I appreciate about what all of you said, or the, um, when I put all of what you said together, I think all of you see that uh, policy and and science and management don't exist in a vacuum. And, and I love the way that all three of you see what you do as part of not just this narrow world that maybe you're hired to do, but the larger world in which your work exists. And so that's so awesome to hear. I would love to hear, to have more time for uh, more questions and, and thoughts. Uh, in fact, we do have more in the chat and for, the, for whoever it was that asked your question, I'm sorry, we're not gonna have time to get to it. Uh, but I want to thank you all for taking the time to, to be here, to, uh, to, to share with our, our students and others who are probably listening. Um, 
and they give us such a broad-minded view and understanding of water and science in the place of, of women, hopefully a broader and broader place in that world. So thanks so much for coming.